You can help this podcast by making your Amazon purchases via deconstructingcomics.com slash Amazon and make that your bookmark for future purchases. We'll then get a percentage of what you spend. It costs you nothing extra and helps us cover web hosting and the other costs of presenting this show every week. This is Kumar. This is Dana. And this is Deconstructing Comics. Welcome to Deconstructing Comics. This is Kumar in Melbourne, uh, Dana in Shizuoka. It's been a long time since we did one of these, as we were just talking about before we started recording. Um, I feel like it's been more than a year or something. Um, something like that. Since we recorded Ungodly. That. Yeah. <laughs> it seems that way. Yeah. Um, but uh, anyway, we're going to talk about uh, Charles Burns's Black Hole. Uh, which started in 95 and finished up in 2005, around then, and uh, was released in uh, book form by Pantheon. It originally was published by Kitchen Sink and Fantagraphics. Uh, as usual, we're coming to this book very late. Um, I don't know what... <laughs> I don't know how this... I, it might have been covered on the show earlier, uh, on what... Tim calls the old site, and I think if it if it was covered, it's fallen off or uh, no longer exists. It needs to be covered again anyway. So um, here we are. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I bought the hardcover when it came out in 2005. I think you bought yours recently, right? Um, I bought ago? mine probably. Uh, yes, yeah, probably a couple of years ago, maybe. Okay. Yeah, uh, but I've got like just the soft cover uh, from Pantheon. Okay. Um, okay, so let's uh, talk about the plot, I guess, a little bit. Maybe you should mention. All right. Well, it's got a very the very basic premise is it's about these high school kids. Uh, it's the time period is a little bit indefinite. Like um, they're listening to LPs. Like David Bowie LPs, so that yep. could be today, really, if you think about it, or um, yeah, it could be early '80s. We don't know. Anyway, there's a um, sexually transmitted disease going around called the bug, um, or they—that's all they call it—is the bug, and uh, it mutates people, um, and the mutations vary from person to person. It's not really predictable. Um, and uh, it's about the relationship between really focusing mostly on three or four characters. But um, once you get the bug, kids tend to be ostracized, people who have it. And so, there's even a group of people who have taken to living in the woods. They become so outcast from society. Um, and that's kind of the most basic surface description of it like the back cover blurb of it almost yeah um, yeah a story about uh teen uh coming of age and dealing with all that sort of stuff of romance yes. and yes. then the the stis thrown in there for good measure yeah yeah um and i think there was uh initially um People often, when they talk about this book, they talk about the 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 bug being like puberty, um, but that's an oversimplification. And everything we can, anything we can possibly say about this book is, I think, going to be an oversimplification. I think uh, everything is working on a lot of different layers. Um, mm. And um, maybe we should mention too a little bit about the art. So if you're familiar with Charles Burns's art. Um, or not, it's, um, if, if you're familiar with it, I mean, his style up to this period was pretty much the same. He usually worked in black and white and, um, really heavy blacks. Like, there's no, there are no gray tones. It's just black or white. Yeah. And panels, it's almost like he worked on black pages and added in the white 
rather than the other way around. They're so black, and it doesn't matter what time of day it is or what room. It's very rarely that you get a scene with a brightly lit sky or something, or a room that's yeah. white or something like that. Everything is very uh, steeped and soaking in blackness. Um, it's very... almost like prints, kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like it could almost it'd be just because uh, literally no no gray tones at all. You could almost see like these are like woodcuts or etchings or whatever, yeah. and then the, each panel's kind of stamped out in black ink. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And um, it's uh, but it's a very, he's got a very smooth, attractive line. Like, and the figures are very attractively drawn, and everything's the lines are really smooth. It's not really angular or aggressive. Or you can call it something like that. But he um. If you're familiar with his previous art, he is great at drawing um, disturbing mutations, disturbingly mutated people, people who look like they're inbred and their eyes are too far apart or something is just slightly off, um, and yeah. it, is, it gives you that unsettling feeling. He's a master of that, and this was kind of the culmination of that. Um, it's uh, kind of... Uh, it reminded me of... Uh, like Giger's art, like the kind of physical reaction I had to it, um, mm. that there's something, there's this kind of biological feeling about it that affects me, you know, it's kind of gives you chills or whatever at certain times. Mm. Um, so I definitely had that strong reaction to it. Um, his earlier work had been mostly kind of short stories, and um, some people will say the short stuff was maybe more powerful because maybe because it was so short and stranger, um, more kind of disturbing, more immediately disturbing. Um, but anyway, uh, back to black hole. Uh, I don't know if we, did we want to add anything more about the, the, the blurb of it before we get into it. Um, no, it's a minor point, but according to the uh, inside uh, flap of the cover, mm -hmm. it's set in Seattle in the mid seventies. Okay, wow. Which well, is actually not in the story no. at all. Uh, <laughs> you, you can kind of guess from the hairstyles and the music that they talk about, and you know, there's no, there's no, uh, you know, CD players or smartphones or anything oh, like that's that. True. You can, kind of place it but yeah i mean it could just as easily be the early 80s and it could just as easily be um new england as yeah as seattle any yeah town, i don't any know town where that in. information comes from but that's the the inside uh, huh. flap of this edition anyway maybe there was one did they mention a suburb at any state i don't remember um, yeah maybe but anyway um okay so the other thing we should probably mention is too that the I'm not, I'm not really sure what the entry point for our talking about this should be, but it's also told out of order. Um, so yeah. you get later scenes happening, you know, it's all kind of messed up out of order. And then you get flashbacks, and sometimes there are flashbacks inside the flashbacks. Um, mm -hmm. so I reread it twice for recording this podcast, and, um, still a little bit, I was kind of trying to piece it together. I mean, that was kind of part of the enjoyment for, of it was trying to, figure out what order things were happening in, um, yeah. in my mind. Um, but okay. So now we, now let's get to the main characters. So, uh, I think we could say there's maybe four really key characters or three even. Um, there's, yeah, I would, I kind of see it almost as, as, uh, two and a half, or sorry, <laughs> one and a half or two okay. kind of couples. Right. Yeah. I guess. Okay. Yeah. There's sort of the main guy, uh, Keith is his name, I think. Yes. Yeah. Keith. Yeah, and and he kind of is in love with this one girl who's not in love with him. Right. Uh, Chris. Yeah. And uh, he knows her from school, and she is involved with uh, what's his name, Rob? I want to say. Yes, that's right, Rob. But she's not initially. She's not involved with him. So, well, yeah. at least in the first scene we get, they're in biology class, and yeah. um. Keith is cutting open. He's trying to act tough, and he's trying to not be affected by cutting open this frog. He's sitting next to Chris, who he has he's infatuated with. He thinks she's totally beautiful or whatever. Um, and uh, he cuts this thing open, and he starts to... He has this inrush, this kind of vision. Yeah. Um, and they're populated by images which 
recur throughout the book. So it's almost like a true vision. <laughs> I don't yeah. know quite yeah. what we want to make of that. And I mean, later on, he has a dream in which he sees a scene which is identical to a scene which Chris saw earlier of like pulling a wrapped piece, a roll of paper out of a uh, wound in her foot. Yeah. I don't know quite what to make of that. Like, I don't make, know quite what to make of a lot of stuff in it. But anyway, so he has this vision yeah. and he passes out. Okay, so that's kind of our first exposure to him. Keith is kind of a, I don't know what to call him. He's a bit of a, he's a bit of a stoner. He likes smoking joints with his friends up in the woods. Um, yeah. and, uh, you know, a couple of times he ends up at the house of these dealers, um, for kind of different reasons. But anyway, that's kind of the crowd he's mixing with. Yeah. Um, and meanwhile, Chris ends up going to a party with, a party where Rob is at. Now, I think she says, like, she had noticed him before, but on this particular night, um, she says there was something dark and sexy about him. Those are her words. And, um, she ends up sleeping with him, and he says, before we sleep together, I need to tell you something. And we know from earlier scene that Rob... Uh, has the bug, and he has grown an extra mouth, which speaks, which is very, at the very bottom of his neck, at the top of his chest, and uh, he tends to wear turtlenecks to cover it up, or whatever, or even shirts cover it up enough, but he says, I need yeah. to tell you something, she says, don't bother, I know, and he assumes she means that she knows that he has the bug, because he thinks everybody knows about it, and they sleep together, and she ends up getting infected, and she didn't know beforehand. So, it seems initially like just kind of, it's like a party hookup. Like, they literally walk into the party and go to a cemetery to have sex in. It's just like, we need to go, you know, just find some place to do it. Yeah. Um, and then later in school, there, uh, uh, she has trouble talking to him, like he's kind of avoiding her, and then finally, at some stage, they reconnect, and then they, Despite the fact that it seemed like it was just a party hookup, uh, they start an intense loving relationship, uh, yeah. with each other. Um, her parents, she goes off for the night with him. She lies to her parents as she's going to a friend's house. She goes with him and they go camping, um, out at the beach. Uh, and that's one of the only scenes, that beach scene, she's, she says, this is going to be the greatest day of my life before it happens. And it's, mm. it's one of the only really white scenes, um, in the mm, whole book. Yeah. And there's, there is one later, which is a similar, very idyllic, like, scene with, with a couple out in the sunlight. Um, but they have that night, and then she comes home, and, um, her parents have found out that she wasn't where she said she wasn't. They suspect it's a boy. They ground her, and they say they're gonna force her to go to see a doctor. Um, now, meanwhile, the bug, the way it's manifested for her is that she has this, her skin starts peeling at the back, and she it occasionally sheds, like her entire skin comes yeah. right off, and it's not really painful, but then anytime she gets another, then it seems to start to cut, kind of, the wound starts open again, and she sheds again, um, which is something that we kind of, we see earlier where, because everything's out of order, there's a scene where Keith and his pals are smoking joints in the woods, and then they go for a wander, and he finds a skin on a tree. And then in the next scene, we see her peeling off a skin and throwing it into the trees, and she's living in a tent at that stage. So we kind of know that things are going to go, somehow are going to go south. So when her, fr yeah. when her parents threaten to take her, make a doctor's appointment to see what's wrong with her or whatever, she's like, whoa, and she um, decides to run away, and Rob helps her, and he sets her up in this camp in the woods. Um, and meanwhile, Keith goes to this stoner's house, and he encounters a girl who's living, or at the dealer's house, and encounters a girl who's living there, who has a tail. Um, and he kind of forms a sexual attraction for her as well, uh, as yeah. Chris, because Chris has gone off with Rob, and she, there's so many elements here. <laughs> and the problem is, I'm, I'm kind of describing all this plot that's happening, and at the same time, I'm like, wow, I'm not really, all of this is just plot, and it's not really covering any of the kind of emotional intensity of what's going on. There's a lot of first-person narration, um, yeah. and it's kind of hard for me to describe how strongly these kids feel for each other, um, 
And it reminded me of a, Tim and I talked about um, this Robert Crumb story that he did called, might have been called Footsie, where he talks about where he's in high school and like just touching another girl's foot under the, t- under the desks. Um, and how intense that was. And I was reminded of how intense that kind of contact was in junior high school or high yeah. school. And reading this was really like, oh yeah, like I can remember just feeling that kind of screaming intensity of emotion. Um, yeah. at that time, uh, do you want? Do you want to add anything? I uh, just just about the complexity of the plot. It's it's kind of something where I can't imagine how it could be better. But I, I almost find like that the complexity or inscrutability almost of the plot is is almost kind of works against the book okay. in some ways. Yeah. Like it, it. I I think that all of that sort of. Um, intensity of the feeling and the, you know, the moment to moment kind of storytelling is, 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 yeah, as you say, it kind of takes you back to that, that time of, of, uh, like just remembering like everything was so important. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) and, uh, and well, and, and I think a big part of this story is that for these kids who get infected, it actually becomes, really important yeah. um i think that that so many of us kind of grew up with the the luxury of of not really facing any severe consequences and this is a story about a you know a group of kids who who don't escape their teenage years unscathed kind of thing right um and and, and, and yeah i sometimes felt like the it, it's almost like it's uh it's almost vignettes uh, yes but it does all tie together, and, and I found that every time I was reading it, I found myself so kind of try so focused on trying to figure out what the hell is going on. Now, when is this scene? Is this a okay? Yeah. So this has the squiggly lines around the like the borders are squiggly, so this is a flashback. Yeah. And then you know you'd forget that you were reading the flashback, and it would flip back, mm-hmm. and you'd kind of miss it. You have to back up, and, and I mean, I guess uh, on one hand, that's kind of the the pleasure of exploring a comic book is that you kind of flip back and forth and and uh, try to piece it together. But it, but in some ways, it's sort of distract distracted from uh, from the uh, the some of the moments and some of the tone and the. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I think yeah. Um, I, I was not really intending that as as a as a ding against the book, but it just it sort of was a a reaction I had to it. Yeah, sure. I think kind of, but I also think um, maybe it was the way he was serializing it, or I'm not sure, but I think in some sense he wasn't that concerned about the plot order because I think a lot of it is is there's a through line of certain images like um, yeah. Like so, she cuts her. So he has that vision of her, uh, her of a cut foot. It's one of the things he sees when he opens the frog. Um, yeah. And then later on, he encounters um, at a keg party or whatever. She's in the woods and she cuts her foot on a piece of glass, and he gets that out of there. This is after he's had the vision, I believe. And um, then, or the vision was a memory. Or right. Yeah. Yeah. That's possible too. But then she. Um, she has a dream where she pulls a rolled up piece of paper out and she un- starts unrolling and it, there's a tail and then she keeps unrolling it and it's a snake. And then later on, he has a, a dream where he pulls a, you know, piece of paper out of her foot and starts unrolling and there's a tail, but this time it's a lizard, which is the symbol of, um, the other girl whose name, Eliza. Um, yeah. so there's kind of like, even when the plot is not, trying to hang things together it's all there's almost this hypnotic repetition of images um because there's one there was one certain plot point because i did especially the second time through reading it this time i did kind of put everything in order and i was like okay this happened here 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 there was one thing that didn't quite add up which is in the community of um these freaks that are living that have been ostracized and are living in the woods together one of them comes back to the group one night and says, guys, I saw, you know, or I says, I saw a, an arm, a dismembered arm in the woods. Yeah. And everybody's like, what? You're, you know, that's crazy. Or they said, oh, remember that time I told you about the arm? And they're like, that's all crazy talk, whatever. But later on, yeah. Keith 
gets totally high out of his mind and ends up wandering up to the woods and stumbles on this community by accident. And he sees the arm on his way there, which freaks him out, naturally. Yeah. And um, he gets there and he's like, guys, I saw an arm in the woods. And they're like, what? And it's like they've never heard of it before. And I looked very carefully at the panels and it seemed like um, the guy who told the story the first time was in the scene, I think. So mm -hmm. there's no way that it, those two don't really reconcile. It's not like it could have happened before or after. Like somebody would rec remember either Keith seeing it or that guy seeing it, you know, mm. the next time it came up. So I, I yeah. kind of, that was the one hole where I thought, well, maybe he was serializing and he didn't really think about the plot that it wasn't that tight or wasn't that important to him. Yeah. Um, it was just kind of secondary to more of like the emotional recurrences. And there's some yeah. things, too, like, you know, like, it almost doesn't matter, because there's a... So what happens is, um, Rob, major spoiler for this book, which is now 20 years old, um, Rob ends up getting <laughs> murdered, um, and Chris is left alone in the woods, and she goes downhill. Like, she becomes an alcoholic, um, and she's living yeah. out there, and she her heart is in... In, is shattered by this because he never came back and doesn't know what happened to him. He just disappeared one afternoon. Yeah. And um, Keith ends up, because he ends up hanging out with the community, because Keith is kind of, he doesn't have the bug but initially, but he is kind of a lost soul. Like he, he doesn't really like his stoner friends that much. And he doesn't yeah. like the way they hang out and the kind of par parties, the way they try to have fun. It's not really, he's not really getting anything out of that. But he's kind of trying to connect with the community, and he's really trying to connect with Chris, because he believes the words are, his words are the one. Um, and he's yep. got this kind of naive thing about the one, and um, he believes it's her, and he tries to be really nice to her, and she kind of can see right through it, and we can see right through it, that he's like, hey, you know, I'm taking care of these people's house for the summer, and you can come stay there and be comfortable and have a shower and stuff, and he prepares all these snacks for her, exactly what she likes, because he's kind of, you know, gotten that information out of her and stuff. Um mm -hmm. But, um, initially there's a scene, um, where, when Rob and, um, Chris first go into the woods, she's really worried. She says, tell me everything will be alright. He says, everything will be alright. As if, mm -hmm. as if that means anything. Because pretty soon after that, he's murdered brutally. And then yeah. later on, there's this very, what I feel is like a kind of, um, you know, the graduate type of relationship where, Keith hooks up with Eliza after this Chris thing is that isn't going to happen, um, and she's you know she's a wreck and she's an alcoholic, and uh, he hooks up with Eliza and she says the same. Tell me everything's going to be all right. He says everything's going to be all right, and it's almost like right. the same. There's that parallel there, and then yeah. and then he goes out and he's they're out in the sunshine, just like you know Rob and Chris were earlier and it's like everything's flowery or whatever but he says the same thing he says that oh I realize it wasn't Chris now I realize that Eliza is quote unquote the one the one is the words he's again he just jumped you know right into it um like he has no he's so naive about these kind of things and, and he has these same kind of dreams about oh yeah we're gonna drive here and I'm gonna get a job and we'll buy a little house and all this kind of uh, and you can almost see in your mind it's all already unraveling. And this is right at the end of the book. <laughs> um, so we don't know what happens yeah. to them. But you can kind of sense that this is not, you know, this is not what it, it's meant to be. And she, because they call her the lizard woman because of her tail, and she talks about wanting to go to the desert, which is another kind of thing you associate with lizards. And she goes out there, and you first see her in the sun, and everything's idyllic, and she says, I love it. I, he's like, isn't it hot for you? And she's like, no, this is perfect. And then he tells her what happened at the, that dealer's house, and the reason she left that house, which is this horrible thing where there was this party and she was raped. And then immediately after that flashback, she says, it's getting too hot out here, let's go in. So all, you know, things are already sour, you know what I mean? Like, there's obviously yeah. things are not as perfect as, it's not a perfect happy ending or whatever. Yeah. Well, I think that's a, one of the really amazing things about the about the uh, book as a whole is there's that, that uh, contrast between really uh, realistic people yeah. in the sense that I, you know, I or at least my sense is that I don't know it's realistic. I couldn't say like, oh yeah, people are like that, but um, 
there's no sort of fairy tale happy ending like the this mm-hmm. guy is completely obsessed with you know Keith is completely obsessed with Chris and then you know he just kind of flips over to Eliza who is affectionate towards him and and uh, perhaps in some way she sort of uh takes advantage of his kindness and and you know not 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 in a not in a nasty spiteful way but uh perhaps she uses him a little bit and and so they end up together on that beach, and it's beautiful and wonderful. But it is kind of unraveling, and you can just kind of see that. Well, they're you know they're probably they're going to get through things. Life is not going to be amazing. It's not going to be a fairy tale, um, but it's 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 going to go on. You know, life is going to go on, and in some ways, they they do escape the. You know, they escape the woods, they escape the town. They're still flawed humans, but I don't know. You could almost see that as is that they're getting out of that phase of their life where everything is just, oh, she's the one or mm. he's the one. Everything's going to be okay. Yeah. Um, we have each other, so we'll be fine. That's kind of a theme that comes or, up with both couples. Yeah. yeah. We'll be we'll be fine or yeah we'll we'll just we'll be and it's not going to be all great necessarily but mm. yeah yeah um, but but then there's that then the contrast of course with all of the uh, I mean the, there's a lot of uh, drug use in the book and and um, a lot of the imagery is really uh, surreal really sure. I mean with the with the uh, mutations and stuff the way that the the bug manifests with people it's 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 almost like uh yeah they're almost like hallucinations sometimes where it's people don't necessarily look totally wrong but uh they look a little bit wrong as you said that kind of sense of uh uh you know somebody's eyes are just a little bit too far apart they're just something a little bit off about them i mean some of them are completely whack you know like dog face guy but uh and some people uh, can pass like chris can pass yeah. yeah Yeah, Chris can pass. I think all the main characters kind of can, you know, Rob and Chris and Eliza and and uh, and Keith all sort of, you know, can uh, can probably get by. Coming up, if the bug isn't puberty, then what is it? The significance of nature and garbage in Black Hole and more. But first, if you value the content on deconstructing comics, critiquing comics and to the bat poles and want to help us move up to bigger and better things, how about donating a few bucks a month via Patreon at patreon.com slash deconcomics? If everyone listening gave just $3 a month, it would make a big difference. We'd be able to reach several of our Patreon goals and bring you more content, including bringing back over 120 early episodes that have long been missing from our website. Check out all our goals and rewards and make your pledge at patreon.com slash deconcomics. Or you can make a one-time donation via PayPal. Send it to donate at deconstructingcomics.com. I'm Batman. And I'm Robin. This is Tim. And this is Paul. To the Bat Poles! The iTunes reviews are in on To the Bat Poles podcast. These guys do a good job, writes Acello. Who knew that the Batman TV show was such a wellspring of insight into Hollywood trivia, 60s counterculture, sexual mores, and even musical analysis? The young brothers know their stuff, says Professor Allen. It is a great mix of nostalgia, analysis, and fun. Highly recommended. You've heard the reviews, now try it for yourself. New episodes on the first, third, and fifth Thursdays of the month on iTunes or Stitcher, or at tothebatpoles.libsyn.com. Batman! Batman, the answer to a policeman's prayer. For nostalgia, analysis, and fun, it's... To the Batpoles. What did you make Sorry. of the bug? Like, what is the... Like, I, like as I said right at the start, I think it's too easy to say it's a, a puberty metaphor, because I can kind of... Initially, when the first issue or so, like, you know, the first 20, 30 pages, you're reading it, and it's like, it's almost obvious. Like, she has a dream of someone's it's being a corkscrew and it's kind of like that you know your body changing in puberty and how it feels kind of like mutations in some way or you know for yourself and other genders um but that's puberty doesn't mean ostracism so 
I think that's yeah. that's too. I don't think that's what the point of it is, and I don't think it's an AIDS metaphor. Um, yeah, although that's, that's no, the one that came to me, but it does. I don't feel that it really fits. It's kind of yeah, because there's a scene later on where one of the guys in the, from the woods goes down to a, a Kentucky Fried Chicken, and um, people in the store are like get out of here. But there's nothing illegal about having the bug. It's just that society yep. doesn't want you anymore. Um, yeah. So maybe, I don't know, maybe there's a little bit of that, or it's, I don't know quite what, what's the difference between people who have the bug and people who don't have the bug? Is there some analog other than AIDS or puberty, which definitely doesn't fit that, I think. Um, and there were certain moments the first yeah. time through, like, does it, does the, does the bug, cause as much as we've talked about so far, the bug almost doesn't need to be in it. Um, yeah. Except that that's kind of, well, I can, I can see a couple of reasons why it needs to be in it. And one is there's something like, you know, she, there, that, that party with, um, Chris and Rob, she says she's kind of noticed them yeah. before. But then she says this night there was something dark and sexy about him. And that to me was like, oh, now he's infected. Like, he's got the bug. And that, I think there, I felt like there was some sort of magnetism coming from that because that's a very key thing, um, for that, you know, for the Keith and Eliza relationship is the tail, um, yeah. in terms of it being a kind of sexually attractive thing because, that image, so Keith, he's wandering through the house, he's supposed to be getting beers for the other guys, and he wanders in the kitchen, there's somebody there who's expecting, but he opens the door, and there's a woman, Eliza, she's naked from the waist down with her back to him, so he can see the tail, but she's nude. And that image has been burned into my mind for ten years, like I've never forgotten that image uh, of her standing there like that. And then she turns around and she covers her crotch, like she doesn't cover her tail. Like, there's no yeah. shame there, but she covers her vagina, which, interestingly, that's another image that he had, uh, you know, that hallucinated about when he kind of mm-hmm. opened the frog, is the hand covering the vagina. And all the other things were, like, open wounds, like the open foot and the open slit on Chris's back and stuff. And this is one of the one things, like, it's the most vaginal image, the vagina, is never, you never see an open vagina, you see a lot of things that look like it. Um, yeah. So she yeah. covers herself up in the front, and um, at that stage she's very attractive and I don't know if coquettish is the word, but she kind of knows the tail is kind of a turn on, and she's like, "Let's go back to my room." And they walk, and she's pulled her shirt down over the tail, but she he can see it kind of wriggling back there. It's a very yeah. kind of Cronenberg kind of body horror attraction thing, <laughs> and um, yeah. That's kind of a turn on, and then they they do have a sex scene later on, in a later visit, and she's like, okay, let's do a doggy stun, and he's like, the tail's getting right, she's like, grab the tail, but the first time she gets down there, she's like, my tail turned you on, didn't it? Like, she kind of knows, mm-hmm. so, um, yeah. there's almost, maybe the bug is more like, as I'm saying this, it's coming to me, it's almost like a loss of virginity, more than puberty, um, that it's kind of setting people apart that way and making them more like once you have it, it's more sexualizing. Uh, although maybe that's oversimplifying it too. Yeah, or is it, or is it in some way just, uh, you know, it's it, in some ways it just functions as a plot device, um, and maybe I, I think it has other functions as well, but. Um, I don't know. I don't know that it, it doesn't fit really neatly into anything that you can kind of say, yeah. oh, yeah, look at this, look at this. Yeah. Um, in, in, in some ways, it's like, OK, this is an episode of X-Files where we've got <laughs> like regular, regular uh, drug dealers, but the drug is from the planet X. Right. Right. <laughs> so it's that, just yeah. it's just some kind of like weird sort of sci fi thing going on and uh and and i don't, I don't yeah, again don't want to say that to cheapen to cheapen it because it it seems to work on a lot of different levels as well um the um 
the HIV analog though is is really really tempting just because of the time sure. frame yes as well you know and I think that um, the ostracism that the people face may be uh, more more similar to to how kind of people dealt with you know HIV infection that mm. you know it said people didn't want to be in the same room with uh, people who were infected with HIV or touch things. And there was all this, I mean, we're old enough that we can remember a lot of the, you know, fear of like restaurant glasses and silverware and stuff mm -hmm. like that. There was, you know, a lot of unreasonable sh pushing away of anything yeah. that was contact with another person. Yeah. Um, of course, none of the none of the historical association with homosexuality is in black hole at all. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if there's even any explicitly homosexual characters at all in the entire book. No, not that. No, not that we see. Yeah. No. Um, not and you know not that that's a, a a deal breaker necessarily, but also yeah, it doesn't really. Nothing really seems to fit super neatly. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah, and it's not it's not supposed to, and I think there's probably yeah. some temptation coming into this thing and needing to say something about it for podcasters, like, oh, we need to tie this up with a bow and make sense of it, and maybe it's yeah. kind of not. But I did see another connection, too, with the bug, um, which is there's, constantly, there's a kind of thing where everybody's kind of melting into nature, and I don't mean that in the bug way. I mean, everybody's trying to become one with nature and people are talking about how they love being out in the woods or on the beach or um you know there's one point very early on where um they have this spot where they always go to to smoke their joints and keeps uh, something like i yep. love being surrounded by the canopy like it's enveloping or something like that the canopy mm -hmm. of trees and um there's two scenes where chris goes into the water one where she dreams maybe but she goes out yep. and her hair is the same as the waves, like it's just indistinguishable. Yeah. Um, there's that kind of thing, but then there later on there's an image might be related to a dream where um, a lot of the bug related growths, like um, the sloughed off skin and the broke Eliza broken off tail from one scene, and these kind of tadpoles, which are a bit like the the growths that Keith ends up with. Um, they are mixed in with piles of garbage, like cigarette butts and cans and stuff. So yeah. it's almost like that's kind of merging into this other world of garbage, which is, that's also kind of a thing which comes up a few times is junk. Mm. Um, yeah. And there's another thing where this guy is taking junk in the woods, like broken dolls and bones and making these kind of Blair Witch <laughs> dolls out of them and tying them to trees. <laughs> yeah. And people are finding yeah. these very creepy dolls are around. Um, yeah. so there's that kind of reclamation of garbage. I don't know. You can, I don't know what to assign, you know, what symbolic log line to assign to that, but you could say that there's something there about it. But the, it seems like the bug is kind of related to this garbage world in some yeah. way. Well, it's, it, yeah, it, it, going back to the thing with nature is people in the book, yeah, they do often talk about how they feel comfortable outside. And when Keith is on his LSD trip, he has to get out of the house and yeah. get away from the TV and yeah, he yeah. goes into the woods. He actually has a kind of a bad trip even once he gets out into the woods. But, but you know, at least he, oh. he feels that you know, going out there into nature is going to chill him out and it's going to be comfortable. And yet nothing in the imagery is comforting or warm right. or like, I mean the <laughs> beach, like when, when Chris is walking along the beach, it's just like, well, a lot of it is in dreams and, and visions and stuff as well. But like the, they're stepping on sharp stones mm. and broken glass mm. and well, that's glass out in the woods. And, and so it's like, um, you know, people are really, People are saying that they want to get out into nature, and people are saying that they feel really comfortable, and yet I don't really think they are. I think there's there's definitely something going on there with with the pollution. You mentioned the garbage, yeah. like there's this there's this wish to to kind of enjoy the beauty and serenity and comfort of nature and the woods, and yet nothing that you see 
in the book. Yeah. It, you know, uh, supports that. I, like, I think some of the beach scenes are, as you, we mentioned before, they're a little bit more idyllic and the brighter sort of scenes. But for the most part, the woods are menacing and creepy and polluted. Yeah, I, I agree because I think the I believe I believe the characters when they say they love this place when when they're out in the woods and they say I love this place I believe that. But when they say yeah. they say I love it when the lights filtering through the trees like this. And the drawing that Charles Burns give you is a very oppressive for us. I think for the reader, yeah. the reader does not feel that way and is not supposed to feel that way because we just have these black leaves, just a swarm yeah. of them that you cannot escape. They're so in your face, you can't escape from them. Yeah. And the, we don't really see that light, the pink light filtering through or anything like that or down yeah. on the ground. All we see is this oppressive blackness. So, um, yeah, I don't know if, I don't know if they can connect with nature. And I think it's those kids that, well, it's hard to say, but all, I mean, the kids with the bug don't connect with nature. And I mean, it's the people with the, with the bug that are creating these, um, bone garbage dolls in the woods and stuff. Um, mm. although, although Keith does live with nature initially and he doesn't have the bug until much later and maybe there's really only four characters. So it's too much of an assumption. Um, mm. But now he actually, you could argue, and maybe it's obvious, but he he get, he infects himself intentionally, basically. Yeah. Right. Like he knows <laughs> yeah. Eliza's infected when yeah. he sleeps with her. Yeah. It's like he does that to kind of, and and as you mentioned before, like he sort of starts spending time with the people out in the woods and stuff who are all infected and he is almost, he seems more comfortable with them. And so he's kind of like infecting himself so that, you know, in that attempt to get into that group or maybe to get back to nature or away from the society that kind of already shuns him. Uh, Yeah. I think that's a really good point. Cause I, I think, yeah, he doesn't connect with people. And at no. this point, at this stage, he's gotten a uh, job at a grocery store, and he's cut his hair. And um, he, I think he totally uses her in this scene, because he stumbles upon her. He, I think he's coming there to hopefully, you know, score some drugs or something. He comes to the house, and mm. she's sitting out on the porch, and he's kind of hoping he wouldn't have to see her again, because, you know, last time they parted, whatever. Um, but she looks rough at this stage, and at this point, he doesn't know... Why she looks as rough as she does, which we don't find until the very end of the book that she was raped at that party. And yeah. he goes down to her room and she had made all this artwork previously and all that's gone. And he's like, Oh, your yeah. art's gone. And he doesn't really try to figure out why she, well, maybe she doesn't really offer up that information, but he's like, Oh my God, I'm going to have sex. I'm really going to do it. And, um, it's kind of all he's at that stage. He's a virgin and he's all, his only concern is losing his virginity. Yeah. Um, so the first time and only time he has sex, um, cause he doesn't see her again, uh, is, is, is to lose his virginity. That's it. He doesn't care. And he knows she's, she's got the bug. Um, so he just kind of uses her and doesn't really care what, you know, what, why she looks, and she, you know, he knows she's in rough shape. Like she's not okay. And she's got yeah. this kind of dazed look in her eye. I think she kind of is looking a little bit better. He goes off to the bathroom, comes back, and she's a bit more with it. Um, but, you know, she's kind of, he kind of knows she's under the influence and she's looking rough. And, yeah. Um, and he's like, well, I, he's so desperate to lose it, his virginity, that he's like, all right, we do it. Um, and he yeah. does it. Yeah. And then yeah, he's, he's pretty, yeah. Pretty gross. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then you know later on he she comes into the uh, grocery store he works where he works and he says hi and hi and he feels really good about it and I think at that stage Chris is going downhill like he's tried to help Chris and he she's like in rough shape and the house everybody all the guys from the woods are starting to live in the house now they're squatting there that he was looking yeah. at for the summer and things are kind of going to shit and then you know Eliza comes in and just gives him a nice smile and she looks well again. Um, cause yeah. she's moved out by this stage and he's like, Oh, Eliza. Yeah. I remember Eliza. You know, it's not like he kind of forgot about Chris. And then next time he meets her basically is after everything. There's this kind of huge climactic 
violent, everything going to hell. And he hooks up with her, and then they go on their road trip to their, you know, happy, sunny future. Um, but it seems like they've had very little contact, and he's already calling her the one, because, you know, he slept with her one time, and she seems to love him, too. Again, I don't know how old she is. She seemed a little bit older to me, uh, maybe be just because she was living with those dealers, but, um, she... Yeah, well, they were college guys, and yeah, I that's got right. The, I get the sense that she wasn't necessarily in college, but she was maybe their age or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, I mean, she's really into him all of a sudden too, uh, with that same kind of high school intensity. Um, so I don't know quite, <laughs> yeah, quite what they but I think yeah, he kind of, I don't know if he said I want the bug, but he certainly didn't didn't give a shit about his life as it was and was happy to get it if it meant he got yeah. laid you know i think that was his priority mm. yeah yeah and i don't think he said he wanted to get it but it definitely no, uh... no but you know what he doesn't care when he gets it because it's very interesting because we get a a scene where um he's getting so he slept with her and then he's getting ready for work and he says a line like oh, okay and then I comb my hair, do all this stuff, put the tape on, and he's wrapping this tape around his chest, and he's like, okay, get on my bike, go to work, and you're like, what? what's the tape? What's the tape yeah. there for? You don't know. And then later yeah. on, it's like, oh, I I got the bug after I slept at the lies of that time, and I've got these growths, and they look kind of like tadpoles, and they're purplish, and it's like, he's unlike, other, when other people get the bug, like the first time you see Chris peeling off her skin, she's horrified. Um, yeah, she's losing her shit. Yeah. Uh, she has a nightmare, and she wakes up from it, and then she rips off her skin and throws it in the woods, and she's like, tears are streaming down her eyes, and and um, you know, um, um, jo Rob is really mortified by that mouth. Um, mm. and we haven't mentioned the scene. There's an amazing scene where he exposes the mouth, um, to Chris for the first time. And yeah. she makes out with it, like she kisses it. She French kisses it. Uh, it's yeah. a real Cronenberg moment. Um, yeah. Which was uh, so intimate. Like, I I felt like watching that was so full on. Um, so, but, so, and for everybody else, the having the bug is a really big deal. For Keith, it's just like, whatever. <laughs> yeah. He's like, okay, I got the bug. I'll live with it. It's fine. Cause yeah. I don't know what he thinks the outcome is going to be. I guess he can pass as long as he covers it up or whatever. But um, yeah, interesting. <laughs> yeah. Interesting how carefree yeah. he was about it. That, and, and going back to the whole bug thing and what is the bug? Like, aside from the mutation, there doesn't seem to be. There's no other. Uh, you know, consequence or whatever. It's, I, I guess, it, it's something that might be a strike against the HIV metaphor is that it's not like, fatal. People no. aren't dying from no. it. Yeah. You know, they're they're they seem to be perfectly healthy. And if if uh, if there wasn't uh, that, you know, if they weren't ostracized from society, they'd just probably continue on their lives normally. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Chris would have continued yeah. her life if her parents hadn't threatened to make a doctor's appointment. She would have yeah. just gone on living in her house and. Yeah. Nobody would have known about it, um, except the kids at school had found out by accident, sort of. Um, yeah. But yeah, uh... <laughs> unless unless it, there was something really subtle in there, because there were the you know the the uh, crazy guys that were like killing people and stuff, and uh, I don't know if that was bug related or if it was just. I know, you know what? That, no, no, I don't think that was at all. I think that was totally like they were the high school guys that got rejected by the girls, and um, yeah, and they just they snapped. They were that those kind of you know the guys that now would go on a machine gun rampage or whatever. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's how that's how I interpreted that anyway. Hmm. Yeah. No. I, same here because it seemed like the rest of those people were all like really friendly and yeah. helpful to chris and keith when yeah. they ended up out there and yeah. when they were in trouble and stuff like that and yeah everybody seemed really really cool except those well i mean those two guys seemed all right just kind of quiet mm -hmm. except 
when they were blowing people's heads off. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, okay, I think we've kind of, <laughs> in a sense, we've kind of covered it. Um, yeah, but kind I, of. I think the thing, I mean, I think I think it's a a massive book. I think it's one of the all time greats. Mm. Uh, I think it's kind of forgotten. Uh, somehow, I, it's kind of, or not forgotten, but at least it's fallen out of the conversation. People don't talk about it much mm. anymore for some reason. Uh, but I think it's absolutely huge. Uh, and it's so moving. And I connected with the intensity that they were mm. feeling. Like, I totally sympathized with that. I felt it. Um, yeah. And it's just the the images are as frightening and beautiful, uh, and I just think the finale is amazing. Um, I feel like Charles Burns's work since hasn't lived up to the power of Black Hole. Um, I've only read a little bit of it, but it felt like something was a little bit. I mean, I can't you can't expect him to create another Black Hole, but um, yeah. Uh, I think it's it's kind of singular in its power. I, I think I think it's absolutely great, despite the. I mean the the problems we've been having. I think are be, have been from trying to put together something that isn't meant to be assembled in a rational way. It's it's more about about the emotional impact of it, which I think is tremendous. I, I yeah I agree. A, a thought I had while we were sort of uh, rambling on about this book was that in some ways i i felt that the the first time i read it just 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 reading it you know like like just just going through page by page uh was kind of the best time yeah um i think you know when i read it in the second third or however many times i've read it like each each time i kind of made a connection plot wise it was kind of that was kind of cool it was like oh Right. Um, well, actually, the second time I read it, I actually uh, realized that Chris and Keith and Rob were different people. Because, uh, oh, my God, they all have the same hair. <laughs> yeah. I seriously was so confused the first time I read it. I didn't realize that at least Rob and Keith, I didn't realize they were different people yeah. for most of the book. Right. And there were a lot of chapters about Chris. Yeah that I actually thought would, that I didn't realize was, was, was about Chris until she took her clothes off. Right. And I was like, Oh wait, that's not Keith. <laughs> uh, uh-huh. But you know, just sort of despite that, um, I think, yeah, I think that first time where you, you know, you can't possibly g- grasp the, the, the mess of plot. And I don't mean mess in a bad way, but just, it's so, um uh serpentine not, yeah serpentine it's not chronological with all of the flashbacks and visions and drug trips and all of those things it's just it's it's uh it's just a it's a it's a an experience an emotional experience of yeah. you know tone and and uh yeah discomfort and longing and obsession and yeah, it's just I th- I think that a lot of uh a lot of times when I listen to this podcast, uh you know, I I kind of discover books that I didn't know about and I read and I uh, yeah, I, I certainly hope that there's a a few people out there that if they haven't read this yet will uh go read it. Yeah. Cuz it's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's uh, a giant a giant. Mm-hmm. It's uh I don't know, maybe it's not easy to talk about, and that's a reason it's not talked about as much <laughs> anymore. But, um, um, yeah, it's stuck with me. And like I said, images from it are still, you know, that image, especially of Eliza in the kitchen, is forever mm. burned into my mind. <laughs> Black Hole is published by Pantheon. Thanks to Kamar and Dana for stepping in this week. Write us at mail at deconstructingcomics.com or look us up on Patreon, Twitter, Tumblr, Facebook, and YouTube. 
All our social media links can be found on the right sidebar at deconstructingcomics.com. Also, please give us a review on iTunes or Stitcher. Our theme is from bensound.com. This coming Thursday on To the Bat Poles, Paul and I are joined by cartoonist and podcaster Joe Dater to discuss the Sandman-Catwoman team-up arc, the last Batman episode broadcast in 1966. Look up To the Bat Poles wherever you find your podcasts or at tothebatpoles.libsyn.com. If you're looking for some constructive feedback on your comic, send it to us and Mulele and I will critique it on our spinoff podcast, Critiquing Comics. Send it to mail at deconstructingcomics.com and please try to keep it to about 30 pages. We're on a bit of a hiatus right now, but we'll be back as soon as possible. Next week on this show, Tom Spurgeon joins Kumar and me to discuss his new book, A History of Fantagraphics, with the great title of We Told You So. Till then, this is Tim, and thanks for listening to Deconstructing Comics. <laughs>